Hey guys, it's Jordan from New Hampshire in the United States, and welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airs Hop podcast. All right, thanks for joining us, everyone. And as you heard in the intro, today my guest is Jordan. Uh, welcome to part two of our series on being an aggressive player in Airsoft. And as I said last time, I don't mean being aggressive to players, but rather how can you adopt an aggressive play style in Airsoft? This is something that we often hear Airsofters talk about. You know, we talked, we said this last time, you know, oh, I need to be more aggressive or how can I be a more aggressive player? And last week we really dig a, did a deep dive with Matt on aggressive play in CQB. And now Jordan is here to talk to us about the same types of concepts but in a more objective-based Milsim style. Most of you will know from previous episodes, uh, as Jordan has been on several times, he's primarily talked to us about his experiences at Milsim events, notably the Stag Ops uh, games. Jordan and, uh, you know, and his team are really, you know, playing, they play all kinds of different types of airsoft, not just uh, Milsim. But his team, the Operators, have really made Milsim their speciality, and they work extremely well as a small unit. So often, um, you know, we have people who enjoy Milsims, but they might not have a group that they're dedicated with. And so the Operators really have this sort of lockdown. Um, we can also sometimes hear from Milsim players referring to their play style as slow, or, you know, taking hours to get into a position. And in that context, you might not think that aggressive play or fast play really has a place uh, in Milsim. But I think you might be surprised by some of the things that we're going to talk to us, uh, that we're going to talk to Jordan about today. So let's get into it. And Jordan, I'm going to start you off by asking you the same question that I asked Matt about aggressive play, which is when you're thinking about, you know, being an aggressive player or, uh, you know, adopting an, ag an aggressive play style, to you specifically, how do you define being an aggressive player? Aggression has a, a bunch of different aspects to it. Um, in video games, people would say being aggressive, like, oh, I'm so aggressive. They just run at the enemy all the time. That's mm -hmm. one way of being super aggressive. Is that always an effective thing? No. In my opinion, aggression can be measured in a couple of different ways. Um, and it's not always just by being on the front lines. Sometimes being aggressive is moving into an outside position in order to provide covering fire for your team to move up. Sometimes your aggression is allowing teammates that are next to you that are stuck in the same spot to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just getting into an aggressive position so that you're not in the same spot further back, but now you have a different angle to allow for more options. In my opinion, mm -hmm. aggression is a way to, you know, while you are advancing forward, I think of aggression as a moment of opportunity. You take that time and say, this is the time I need to move forward or I need to go out wide or I need to use this point to my advantage instead of sitting back. That's right. kind of what I think aggression is. Um, it's not just going at people. A lot of times aggression is you know, just positioning, just a mindset, maybe just putting down more fire at a given point without even moving. That can right. be aggression in itself. So just opening opportunities for your team. So, yeah, absolutely. And I can totally see where you're coming from with that. And, I, and, you know, one of the advantages that we have about having a conversation with you in particular is really you haven't been playing Airsoft a very long time. You've played a lot of Airsoft, but you've been playing Airsoft like in a, a relatively like I think it's like three years now at this point. Or it's crazy you're, now you're, you're, that it's you're, been three years. Yeah, yeah I right? talked to you in 2021 when I first played ever. And yeah. now it's 2024. So it's almost three years now. Yeah. And the the cool thing about that though is number one, I mean, you can showcase you you showcase pretty well. Look, like how quickly can a player progress if they're really dedicated and stuff like that, which we're not really going to get into. But I mean, that's kudos to you. But because the time capsule is so small, it's it's much easier for you to compare what you were like in your first games, your first week, your first month, compared to where you are today. I mean, if you ask me to do that, you have to look back seventeen years. Like that's a different sort yeah. of challenge. Uh, because I was also a very different person individually, you know, with that time scale. So I guess my question for you is when you think about what you just talked about with aggression, sort of like taking the opportunity, seizing the moment, whatever that looks like in any given situation, how have you seen that progress in yourself from the first days, not just in terms of how aggressive you are as a player, but how your perception of that has shifted? When I first ever started playing, 
I was not very aggressive. Um, mm -hmm. I, when I very first started playing, I was all the time getting stuck behind cover or I was going too forward. I was taking objectives too straight on as opposed to looking at other options, which when you do that, a lot of times that is the path of most resistance. You will continue to get stuck or get hit over and over mm -hmm. and over again. Um, after I met my teammates, which was pretty soon into me playing, probably about like the fourth time I started playing the game, um, specifically Will and Matt on the first day that I played with them. Um, I learned of aggression in a different way. And so I learned pretty quickly, Will is a slower player. He likes to take things more strategically, but it doesn't mean that we're not being aggressive while we're doing it. A lot of times mm -hmm. we're flanking and flanking is aggression, but you're avoiding contact for as long as you can until you are in the perfect position to strike. So when I first started, my aggression was just, I'm going to just run forward. I'm just not going to get stuck in cover. I'm going to take out an enemy and I'm just immediately going to move. And that was what my aggression was when I first started. Over the years and working with teammates in squads that we have played with for many, many hours and now years of playing with them, um, you get to learn how to play off of each other and what you need to do in a given moment to press forward. Does that mean I need to put some super heavy covering fire so that Will can flank out wide while they're looking at me. Does that mean we need to go totally quiet and slip off the radar and go around the back and have not people, you know, people don't even know that we're there before we're able to strike. Does that mean that we need to push forward with the entire group? Because that is sometimes what you need to do. Just go straight at the enemy. Um, it has changed for me because I don't think of aggression just as movement anymore. Um, I, it's so much different than just, running at people on the field do i yeah. think that you can flank for hours maybe sometimes but if you are just flanking for hours at a time and you're just going slow all the time you have to be able to flip that switch and just go on the moment's yeah. notice well and i mean it's interesting because i think and i mentioned the same thing to matt i think for many players including myself you know in my own journey when i was looking at like okay how do i become a more aggressive player all this kind of stuff like headlong charge right want to be more aggressive just run at the enemy Right. And in reality, that's not, I mean, yes, it can be effective like in individual instances, but overall as a strategy is not that great because for reasons you mentioned, which is number one, you get bogged down. Or generally speaking, if you're running like, you know, 50, 60 feet out of cover, you're probably going to get shot. Right. Mm -hmm. That's likely going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, so that, that part is interesting because I think that's where people's brain default to. It's like, I just need to run at them faster. But you talk about sort of like this flipping the switch of like knowing. And I think for many, for many players, especially like as you're trying to develop, knowing when to flip the switch is one conversation. And then knowing how, to, like what to do when you want to flip the switch is another. So I guess the first question I would have for you is as you're doing this, this sort of progression for yourself and working with your teammates, because I think that's something that we can get into and we don't, you know, we don't want to minimize because it's very important. Like yep. Who you play with is very important. How, how did you learn? It's like, okay, I need to start, I need to try something different now. Like I want to be aggressive, but I need to flip the switch. Like now is the time for me to go and do something different. What did that feel like? What did that look like for you? It happened pretty early on because I was dealing with people that knew how to do it from the beginning. I mm -hmm. learned from my teammates very early on that it's not all about just going forward. Um, and a lot of it changed once I came, kind of came into my role as a support gunner um, and I started getting into LMG gunning and just like the theory of what I'm supposed to do as an LMG. Because as a support gunner, typically it's guys carrying bigger, heavier guns. Uh, and, you know, Some are heavier than others and some are longer than others, but you know, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, yeah. But typically when you think of a support gunner, an LMG gunner, it is shoot just shoot oh they're being they're sitting back providing a base of fire for other people to move that does not always help it does not help at all in fact something that i learned early on is that sometimes i am providing my own covering fire for myself to do things i was actually playing with uh demo night so dan um and we were playing during a milsim and he looked over at me because i would find an opportunity like all right I've cleared right. I've cleared left. I know there's enemies right in front of me. This is where I need to focus. And there's no good way to do this besides providing my own fire. I would stand up and I would be out in the open, but it's while I'm laying down fire on enemy positions and I'm creating my own suppression to be able to get myself to move and 
my teammates around me. Mm-hmm. And Dan looked over at me and he's like, Jordan, I don't know how you just stand up and just shoot at people and you don't get hit. And I'm like, it's because I'm standing up and I'm shooting at people and they yeah, don't really. want to get hit. And I have that superiority of fire with an LMG that I'm able to do that as long as I'm not dealing with like 40 or 50 people in front of me. So when it comes to like flipping that switch, like figuring it out, it is a trial and error. You will die many times doing it. You will get hit a ton of times doing it. But it's just like an airsoft when you get stuck in cover. If you never try to progress forward, you will never get better at doing it. And time and time again, I've found that it's much better to be trying to put down fire on the enemy than being stuck in a spot. So yeah. sometimes it's just, all right, you know, I know, like I would not stand up if I knew that I had no information in front of me. I would not stand up and step forward if I knew I did not have some semblance of they're to my right, they're to my left, or they're in front of me. If I just stand up like that, I'm going to get hit. So mm-hmm. it has to be used in a in a smart manner. If I know I'm covered to the right, I can stand up and look to the left and provide fire for us to move quickly. If I know I'm covered to our center, then I can move quickly to the right to get an angle on that center coverage. Um, it, it's, I guess it's difficult to explain when to flip that switch because until yeah. you do it and it works, you don't know. And I think that's a lot of airsoft. Like until you yeah. try it and it works, then you, you're never going to know. Because I was going to say, like the first time you stood up out of cover and st- started shooting you with your LMG or whatever, uh, chances are you probably got hit that time, right? Like mm-hmm. you know, like you that like you were saying, it's it's lessons learned, right? Maybe not the second time, maybe not the third time, but the first time you probably learned the hard way, I would suspect. But there's sort of what is the impetus before you before you actually do stand up and you're like, okay, what is going through your mind? Like you're behind this piece of cover. You're like, okay, I know I've cleared left or I know I've cleared right or whatever's going through your head. Then you're like, okay, well, the only thing I can do now is stand up. Like, how does that sort of go through your head? It's a situational based thing. Um, If we are on a point where there is an important objective in front of us, let's say there is a a bomb that they are trying to retrieve and we are defending that. In in this case, the exact situation I was talking about, we were up on the hillside at Feel Good Farms and there was a bomb that we had at a down plane slightly down the hill from us. And we had like 50 green team running up at the 15 of us that were on militia <laughs> at that time. Um, and they had to get that bomb or that hostage, whatever it was, it was some sort of objective there and they had to bring it back down the hill. And as they were getting closer, I said, okay, well, either we let them get it right now or we try to stop them from getting it. Um, it it's not just a, oh, right, I decided it's time to get up and shoot. Um, you kind of have to catch them off guard. If you wait for a second and you're providing no support fire, they're like, maybe he's reloading, maybe his gun's jammed. You know, It's a mind game as well mm-hmm. for a regression. Because if you're always going balls to the wall, I'm getting up and shooting and standing and running at people all the time, they're going to be like, oh, there's Jordan. He's going to run at us. Let's just Mm -hmm. hold an angle and then he's going to get us. Sometimes you ought to be like, all right, I'm just providing covering fire and then just decide, all right, now is the time that we have to make an action because we don't act right now. Or if we wait even longer, then this is going to be much harder for us. So a lot of times it's just analyzing the situation that's in front of you and saying, if we don't act now, then we won't have that chance to act in the future. Um, You have to take that moment like a violence of action type of thing, like catch them by surprise be very decisive. So I think what's interesting though, and I, you know, if we compare uh, the Milsim conversation we're having or objective-based conversation compared to like CQB, one of the things Matt was saying was like, okay, well you get shot, you run back to respawn and run back out and you can get back there. Basically, uh, if you're fast enough, it can be like nothing has changed by the time you get back there, which yep. in the context of a Milsim game, that's not always going to be the case. And so one of the other things that you likely need to factor is the risk that you are taking by doing that, right? So how in the context of a game, so you're, you're talking about like we need to be decisive, et cetera. How do you factor in that other risk angle? Understanding that not every Milsim game is the same. So your respawn rules are going to be different. And stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a difficult question. That's, that's, that's tough because, you know, in Milsims, typically you are walking much further. And typically in outdoor airsoft, you are walking much further in general. Mm-hmm. But in Milsims especially, um, a lot of times when you get shot, you have a bleed out period where you can't do anything. Or you only have, let's say you get shot, then you have a 10 minutes and then you're dead. If you don't have your teammates pick you up and revive you, then you're done. Um, And sometimes it could be hours until you get back to your respawn and then you're just dead following around your team. So I'm going to describe this in a weird way, but it's kind of the way that I think about it. Um, 
in Escape from Tarkov, and people that have played this game will understand this, you have a certain sense of fearing losing your gear. And in Airsoft, mm -hmm. it's a similar sense of fearing losing your positioning, fearing yeah. having to walk back to spawn. The enemy has the same fear that you do. They also are affected by getting shot and having to go back to spawn. They also are affected by having that huge walk behind them as soon as they get hit. Or if they don't have a medic ban, they're just going down for good. Um, I, this is coming from a support gunner's viewpoint, of course. But that is like half of my job is making them hesitant to push us. And if I show them that I'm not afraid to lay down accurate long range fire, where they're like, if I peek this, I'm probably going to get hit. So I can't peek this. Mm -hmm. They are probably not going to want to do it. And then as soon as you show your regression, like, okay, they're moving on us. Now, what are you going to do? Are you going to try to hold your position while you see enemy accurate fire coming in on the known angles? Or are you going to try to retreat? And sometimes that's what it is. It's like a, a push and pull, give and take. You can't always be super aggressive because then they'll fall back and then they'll be waiting to ambush you as you like uh, approach the, the crest of the hill. But you can't always be just defensive because the more ground you give up, the less angles you have to work. So you have to fight for that middle ground all the time. And I guess that's kind of where I think of it. I don't want to fall back so far that I'm now at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. I want to hold my ground until there's absolutely no question that we cannot do this anymore. And then you give it up. Because if you give it up way too early, it's like, all right, I'm going to give them, I'm going to keep backing up and backing up and backing up until now we're not effective anymore. And they yeah. just edged us off the point. So it, that aggression is just so much more about positioning in the situation that it's not even just about like, I'm going to shoot everybody that I see coming over this hill. Half the time, it's just keep them off of this hill so that they can't do anything and we can continue yeah. doing what we're doing. Well, it's, it's you know, I, I, I want to reiterate what you said, because I think it's so is so salient and i think people miss the point on this a lot like i'm not afraid to get hit by a bb i don't think you are either judging by the shiner on your nose i expect that you're also not afraid to two get weeks hit by ago BB, it's still right? healing yep. yeah two weeks yeah and i would say for the vast majority of airsofters who aren't brand new um they've been hit before there is no real it's not a fear of being hit right unless i know that there's a sniper out there who's rocking like you know point like six zero bbs shooting like three jewels like maybe but for the average re replica, like, I'm not concerned. Mm -hmm. What I am concerned of is getting hit and then having to go back to respawn, getting hit and being taken out of the game or losing my position or whatever that looks like. And so I think what you said bears repeating that you're not the only one who feels that way. Generally speaking, the other players also feel that same way, unless you're dealing with some sort of like CQB lunatic or whatever. Most people are going to feel that same way. And you're, you, what you're saying about being a support gunner, I think, ties in neatly to that, is that your job is to exploit that, right? That is absolutely my job. Um, the, the whole goal of being a support gunner is not to rack up the kills. You do. A lot of times you will end up racking up a bunch of kills just because you have that huge magazine and that fire rate. But my whole goal is to get my team and my, my squad to have good positioning and be able to advance. If mm -hmm. I'm not doing that, if I'm not shooting at people who are keeping their heads down, I am no better than any other rifleman that's on the field. In fact, I'm probably worse because I have a heavier gun and now I'm limiting myself in my actual, uh, my force multiplier that it provides. So mm -hmm. if I am not doing the keep their heads down routine, I am not doing a good job. I mean, that comes along with communication and positioning. And, and I've right. talked before about what does it mean to be in an aggressive position, especially as an LMG gunner. Um, something that people think all the time when they see LMGs is, oh, they're LMG. He's got a bipod. He's going to set up on that cover and he's just going to and shoot everything that he sees. That is a good way to send yourself back to respawn very mm -hmm. quickly. If you put yourself in that position where you are a mounted non-mobile target, you are going to get hit and, and that's it. If you are not, in my opinion, if you have a replica that allows you to do this, you need to be just as, if not more, mobile than the riflemen, or at least be willing to be more mobile than the riflemen that are on your team, the people that are next to you. Because they can't move without me a lot of the time. If I yeah. go down, that is a huge, like, the, the LMG is down. I've, that's happened before, and I've rolled over and given my gun to Will. And then he's gone and, and gotten, like, four or five kills, like, off the rip just because he grabbed my gun. Yeah, like you. Um, and, and, he's, <laughs> and he's like, all right, this is too easy. I'm like, well, I mean... 
kind of sometimes like it's yes yeah. it's an advantage but if you are if i go down and there's nobody there to pick up the the piece it's like you just lost a, a huge force of what you have in front of you so mm -hmm. my guys can be aggressive when i am there to lead them in on being aggressive if i am not there then they get stuck in the same cover that we do unless we have really good movement especially if they have enemy lmg fire coming in so it's not just you know sticking in one spot holding an angle and just being there sometimes it's all right i know this lmg is mobile i know if if i start shooting at someone and they go into cover chances are i'm not going to be sitting there looking at the same corner when they come back up they're going to be in front of me and i'm going to be out to the right so they're going to peek up to look at me and i'm going to be a wide angle on them now because they yeah. didn't know where i was so that second I say, you guys move now because I'm suppressing. In like five seconds, you can cover a lot of ground. And then you are in a totally different position than the enemy saw you last. And now you have the drop on them because you still are aware of their positioning. So by fire su superiority sometimes is aggression. Yeah, but tied into that, I think you did a really, you did a really good job exp ex explaining that. Like, it's not just about fire superiority or it's positioning of fire superiority, which means that as an LMG gunner and you're, and, you know, with your squad in general, like, you need to be willing to move and move quickly when the situation needs. So you need to be aggressive and quickly with the team given the situation. So I think what's interesting, we talked about this at that sort of in the intro, I mentioned this, like a lot of people really feel that Milsib is a slower paced game, right? Where it takes hours for you to get into position. And then once you get there, you're just going to lock it down. You're not moving for hours. You're just holding that sector and, you know, like, if there's threats on the field, like, you're responding to those threats, but, like, you're not trying to, like, basically murk them. Like, you're just, you're holding your position. If the threats come to you, that's fine. Otherwise, you're not going to be making fast moves. And what I'm hearing from you, and sort of, we talked about this before as well on previous episodes, but that's not how your squad operates. And that's also a good way to get overrun. A very good way to get overrun. Let's say we are defending a hill, a bunker hill. This is actually very reminiscent of what we've done before if you have that position a fortified position that's awesome right it's nice to have a fortified position but when you are on that fortified position there are positions from there that enemies will expect you to be they look they're like all right there's a bunker there there's probably going to be a gunner in this bunker or there's going to be somebody on this hillside like they mm -hmm. look at opportune positions for you to be and people say this in a lot of games and a lot of things but the best defense being a good offense a lot of times when you are playing a defense, you need to be aggressive to keep people out of your zone of danger. Because once yeah. they get in so close and they are on top of your bunker, that's when grenades can start coming out. That's when enemy teams can flank in behind you while you're dealing with a threat that's close. And they can just schwack your entire team without you being able to handle it. If you mm -hmm. are able to stop them before they're able to get into a position of fire on your base, it gets 10 times easier. Uh, mm -hmm. Some, you know, it's it is exponentially easier to deal with the problem before it gets into your range of being a problem because then once you are on there there's bb's flying overhead you're getting suppressed everything's going to to crap because they are like all right there's a lot of guys on this hill we need to deal with them but when you are able to stop them from being mounting an offensive on you that is aggression in itself you could be defending while being aggressive on the defense it's not just sitting on the base and just waiting for it. 45 yeah. minutes for people to be there when we're on defense we're patrolling we're sending out recons in the area to scout out if we see enemy movements two three hundred feet away 300 feet away from our base so we're looking a good distance away and making sure everything's locked down on the inside yes but once they get into that 200 foot zone around your base you're under attack you're under fire you don't yeah. want to be in that situation. You don't want them to be within 200 feet. You want to get them before they're even in the realm of threatening your immediate fortifications. So hours, hours of patrolling, hours of recon to then hold a position, that that sounds like a good way to just get shot and then be done. <laughs> like I would yeah. be very upset if I got shot after four hours of a recon flank and then that was it. That that doesn't sound like a fun time to me. And I mean, you're and the fun time you're describing really is only one example. Like presumably at this milsim, the people who are attacking your fortified position are also playing that milsim. So like, how are they going to be experiencing milsim if they're not being aggressive and 
you know, fast moving in the position, like in this, the situation that they find themselves in. I can't imagine that if you are like, I, you know, you talked about like the, the last stag ops game that you did, like you're attacking this like bunker on top of a hill with no NVG, which is a situation that has changed, but we'll talk about that some other time. Um, but like, chances are you, you know, like there's some aggressive play that's involved in that, um, that you need to be willing to exploit the positions that you're in. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to be successful. And you were. I, yeah, I have a great example of this. And I actually, we talked about this on the, the scapegoat episode. Um, when we were crawling in the dark with no night vision, we could not see anything. We were under heavy enemy fire that entire time. And if we would have stopped and been like, all right, we can't see, we're getting shot at, that's it. We would not have accomplished our objective and destroyed the enemy respawn and put up the flare to like burn their their base. Because mm -hmm. when we did that, that literally stopped every enemy on their team from being respawned unless they were medic. And once they ran out of medic beds, they were dead. Right. Other squads were there. And I'm not, not knocking on any other squads. There was a lot of people that left. But other squads were there that were getting stuck at the bottom of the hill. And we looked at each other specifically matt and we were like matt we need to crawl this and will's like yeah we need to crawl this and matt's like i really don't want to crawl this and we crawled it we right. crawled all the way up that hill in the pitch black in the, in the the wet you know winter ground that we were dealing with at the time um and since we were able to do that we were able to stop what was going on that was slow paced while still being aggressive we mm -hmm. were not running up that hill we were taking that so slow snail crawling up that damn hill in yeah. the pitch black, like at least 250 feet uphill. And that was slow moving while still being aggressive. I, when I think of just being, you know, this is a, a super slow play. Sometimes when I think of people saying that, I think of them avoiding conflict, walking slow, just checking everything. And you do do that. You absolutely do do that. Mm -hmm. But you cannot do that all the time because that is how you get stuck. That's how you don't abuse the moment of opportunity that you get. That's how you get indecisive when a situation comes up and you say, listen, we got to go now. That's happened many times. Sometimes we get in a shit situation, crap situation. And um, <laughs> sometimes we get into a really bad situation. And from that point, uh, we just look at each other and we say, what are we supposed to do now? Mm -hmm. There really is not a good answer sometimes. Sometimes it's just, we have to flank or we have to move. We have to do this because when you get stuck in that same spot, the enemy knows that you were stuck in that same spot. And now they can relate to everybody else that's on their team. Yep. These guys are in that spot. And guess what that means? That does not bode well. That yeah. does not bode well for you and your team. But it's, it's interesting. So I, and I want to, you know, come back to you, like uh, crawling up that hill, right? Like the challenge, I think, and, and you talk about like, you know, players are like, you like, oh, it's slow paced, it's slow paced. And, Crawling up that hill in the winter ground weather as you're talking about, that sucks, right? That is not what I would describe as type one fun. It's probably type two fun, maybe even type three fun, right? For those of you who know what that means. It just, it sucks. It's not a good experience. And so I think a lot of people who are doing airsoft for fun can be forgiven for going, that sucks and I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. But I think that's different than saying oh well in the type of airsoft that we play that's not really how we play that's not really a factor it definitely is right you need to be aggressive and i think you've talked about you know flanking you've talked about like oh well we don't really have we don't really want to do this but it's the only thing we can do generally speaking what you're talking about as when it comes to being aggressive in a milsim setting it's doing the hard thing versus doing the easy thing and I can totally, like I said, like people play airsoft for a variety of different reasons. You want to have a super fun time, chill time with your friends. Totally cool. And that doesn't necessarily involve doing the hard thing. Also totally cool. However, the, the teams that do do the hard thing, they're the ones who see the kinds of success that you saw because, well, nobody else is doing that, right? Well, and that's also how you learn whether or not that yeah. hard thing is worth it. If we were every single time crawled up a damn hill and every time we got up there, we, we died. Man, that's going to really weigh on our mental the next time we think of, oh, what option do we have crawling yeah. up the hill? Right now, we are two for two crawling up the hill in the dark. <laughs> so, I mean, it. whenever it's like, oh, this really sucks, but we should do that, we know that it's worked in the past. Mm -hmm. And even if it doesn't work for us next time, we know that it has. And until we get to try that and we put ourselves through that, that you know, we, we can't say whether or not it's going to work. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've said, all right, you guys want to go on a flank with us? 
And they're like, yeah, sure. And then I say, all right, we're going up and over that hill. And it's like a, you know, 150 foot incline that we're, we're going up. And they're like, yeah, no, never mind. Yeah. Okay. okay. That that's fine. It, it sucks. It really does. Especially when you're hiking with all that gear on. Um, but like, that is an aspect of Milsim that you have to deal with. Yeah. If you are not willing to do that during a Milsim, you are actively putting yourself at a disadvantage for the people that are willing to do that. Yeah. And when they do do that, and when you get flanked by them because they were willing to put in that work and go on that 15-minute hike up a hill that nobody else wanted to do, you're going to be like, damn, that really sucks. They put in the they, – they, they flanked all the way around us. They went up that hill, and they came behind us like, yeah, we're out of breath. Yeah, it sucked. Yeah, it's going to suck even more tomorrow. But – Right now, that was the best option that we had. And we've yeah. talked about this before. New players and even, you know, veteran players that have played for a long time. The path of least resistance is like the key for a lot of people in Airsoft. They just see, here's the point, A, B, going right in. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is what works. In fact, a situation that happened recently, um, we should have done that. We went around and by doing that, we exposed ourselves to enemy patrols seeing us because we weren't going straight at them. So there's there's an argument to be made. Sometimes it only makes sense to go straight at them because right. going out wide will get you spotted. But if everybody is doing that, like if you when you spawn and you see people run out the gate, about 70% of the people that you see running in a given direction, that is the path of least resistance. That is where most of those people are going to get stuck. Yeah. They're going to get exactly stuck right, right in the center. That that is just yeah. how it works. When you wait for a second and then you see all right three guys branch off to the right, five guys branch off to the left, 40 guys go up the center. You get the idea of like, all right, well, now I know where most of everybody else is going to be. Now I got to deal with the people that are willing to do the hard stuff now. And that's yeah. where you get into some of the best firefights ever because the people that are willing to put in that work are typically people just like you. And they're typically the people that you have to worry about when you're playing the game <laughs> yeah. because they are willing to put in that work. Yeah. Um, it's just a whole different aspect. You can be aggressive without going straight. You can be aggressive without uh, just going balls to the wall, running at people all the time, but you can also be super aggressive by doing that. And I've done it in CQB as well. And Matt probably went over this. I didn't get to watch the episode yet, uh, but CQB is a whole different world. Yeah. Um, when I first played CQB, it felt like I was playing Airsoft for the first time again. Um, people just running around corners, like reckless abandon, sprinting through hallways in the pitch black. I was afraid I was going to get a muzzle to the face a few times. Uh, I saw a guy run into a wall and he like his tooth went through his lip the like two weeks ago. Like, oh, he tripped and hit the wall. And I was like, oh, my God, what happened? And he's like, I thought he got a tooth shot out. And he's like, no, I fell and face first into the wall. And his tooth like went through his lips. So I'm like, ah, that's tough. That's, that's a real rookie tough. move. But yeah, that is see that is like some of the stuff that happens yeah. when you're out there in speed QB. In CQB in general, those people are flying. And the thing is, like Matt said, you don't have that respawn time. Your respawn is typically 50 feet behind you, 100 yeah. feet behind you, and you get back in like a minute at most if you're walking it and, and you're back in the game. When you yeah. put in that effort on the Milson field, man, that 15-minute hike uphill when it's raining, that, that sucked. Yeah, it did. But you know what sucks? The people that you had to take down because they weren't expecting you to do that. And now they're walking back to base in that muddy spawn where everybody has been walking and it's all muddy because everybody keeps walking through the same trails. And they're like, wow, man, I really wish we would have done that. I really wish yeah. we would have had a team out there. It's, it's just a different, a different playing field. So, I, you know, we talked about sort of the flicking the switch and like understanding it's like, okay, well, now is the time. There's an opportunity, et cetera. But I think a challenge for especially for newer players or players who are new to sort of trying to be aggressive is the idea of like, okay, so I recognize that there's an opportunity here or I need to make a move or something. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Right. So in a Milsim context, like, and I think you, you've touched on it a little bit, but I'm curious to hear. So as an individual player, and I want to talk about the team in a second, but you as an individual, so you're like, I need to do something. And chances are charging at the enemy is probably not going to be it, right? Like nine times out of 10. How do you learn or how do you figure out what you're supposed to do or what you need to do in that situation, right? To get yourself out of where you are. A good way that I like to think about it is if I was the enemy right now, like a lot of times what they're, what they're doing to you is exactly what they don't want being done to them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're suppressing your position and I can't move. 
wow, that really sucks. Can you imagine if you were suppressing their position and they couldn't move? They'd be in the same spot as you at that point. So sometimes when I, when I think about like, all right, what do I need to do now? What they're doing to me is typically what I end up needing <laughs> to do to them. If they are yeah. shooting the crap out of my cover, the first thing that I need to do is get a gain on where that person is. And I need to make them stop doing what they're doing. Because as soon as I can do that, I'll say, Will, I'm going to suppress this. As soon as he stops shooting, you go. As soon as we open that line, that, that changes the game completely. Now that guy is not suppressing two or three people, and you can move. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not just, all right, um, what are they doing that I don't really like right now? Let me do that. Sometimes it's, okay, what would put us into this in an advantageous position where what they're doing right now is no longer affecting us? Sometimes that means that if they're suppressing that position, you hit the ground and you crawl and you get into a different position. And mm -hmm. now they don't know where you are. And now they're wasting their resources. And then when you get the opportunity, you're like, all right, they're still shooting. I know where they are. You pop up and you shoot them. And now they're gone. Sometimes it's playing the element of surprise game on those people as well. But I, I feel like a good general rule of thumb with what do I do now? I'm stuck. What am I supposed to do? What's making you stuck? What is the enemy doing to you right now that is causing you to be stuck? Yeah. Because if you are able to do that to them, they are going to be in the same position as you now, and you will be able to turn the tables. You just need to find that opportunity to do so. So if they're suppressing you, you need to peek a different angle. You can't peek out on that angle that they're suppressing you unless you get somebody else to, to make them stop shooting first. If they are actively moving on you to the right and you're like, oh my God, I'm losing my cover, you need to counter move them. You need to get out of that position or you need to be ready to shoot them as soon as they come around your corner or as soon as they go out wide on you. Um, a lot of being aggressive is honestly just counterplay. It's a, all right, they're doing this. I'm doing this. It's kind of like a, like a flow chart type of thing. Like, oh, enemy mm -hmm. is suppressing me. Now I have three options. Either I stay in cover, I move, or I provide covering fire to make him stop shooting. Yeah. Um, those are the, the typical things that go through my head are, all right, what, what is happening to me right now that I can change so that I can now do what they're doing to me? And that's typically what I go for. So if it's they're shooting at me and I can't move, either reposition and fire on that position, get somebody at a different angle to stop them from doing what they're doing, or just disengaging completely and coming up in a different spot. Half the time, it's just a, like a game of chess. Like, all oh, right, they're, they're showing their piece right now. I know what they're doing. I'm going to now affect that in a way that that move is no longer working on me getting out of their trap and then going forward from there so i'm sorry if that was convoluted it's really no, no, difficult I, in the moment to to describe it but it's really a I, counterplay yeah and, and i mean i think it makes total sense like if you think about put yourself in and i mean it's it's easy to to do this on a podcast it's harder to apply that in the context of a game especially if you're you know relatively new and you're you're concerned about getting a hit or you're you know all this kind of stuff you're probably not thinking very coherently right? Mm -hmm. Or you may not be thinking at all, you're just reacting, right? Which is legit. That's why we build muscle memory and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, if you have that thought, absolutely, the thought should be, what does my enemy want in this position? Right? What are they trying to do? Right? They're going to try and tag me out, they're trying to put fire out, whatever that is, and then responding to that and understanding what they what they're trying to achieve, then helps you determine sort of what you want to do. But what's interesting is I, I would say, especially if you think about the average game that you play at a field at a skirmish, your enemy is probably not even thinking that deep about what exactly they're doing. At a milsim, it might be different though, mm -hmm. right? You might be dealing with coherent squads. And that's the second part that I want to talk to you about. So we talked about what do you do as an individual, but then what? how do you then turn on the aggression at the squad level, right? So you've, or not necessarily squad, but like your team level, you've got your teammates there, you know, you got Will, you got, you know, two other dudes, right? How are you then coordinating with them to deal with that, to, <clears throat> well, to deal the aggression? Right. As my as the job that I have as a support gunner, um, once I start putting fire on them, first of all, it's my job to shoot and yell. Those are like okay, my yeah. two my two main my two main jobs are to shoot at the enemy, make them stop shooting at us, while also communicating to my team where everybody is and exactly what they're doing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been, you know, and I've said this in a bunch of podcasts that communication is like the most important part of airsoft, like ever. You can have a crappy gun that doesn't shoot very far, but if you communicate and you move well, man, you are going to do great. You, you are mm -hmm. going to do awesome out on yeah. the field. So the main thing for me, coordinating aggression with my team is they, they understand that when I'm shooting and I'm like, all right, I need you to move. Like, I, I'm going to provide fire. I need you to go. 
they are putting that trust. Like, all right, I know Jordan's shooting at this person. And sometimes they get hit. And sometimes that sucks. Like, sometimes it's like, all right, I'm going to cover you. And then there was somebody else shooting. Or my fire, the guy doesn't care about it. And I don't end up hitting him. And he ends up tagging out one of my guys anyways. Sure. Um, but you know, that, that's airsoft. But through trial and error of, all right, we can now move because Jordan's shooting at the enemy. Or I can, I can now move because my teammate is covering me. Bounding movement is not always just me shooting for my team while people are moving cover to cover. Like sometimes it's me shooting, Will and Matt moving up, them holding a position and fire, providing fire for me so then I can then move up. And it's it's a learning thing. Like, all right, mm -hmm. I'm going to take this tree and once I get there, you move. That is a huge piece of aggression. When you have, all right, I'm going to, you are gaining ground on the enemy. You are cutting down the angles that they can now attack you from. And then you move further past that. You are just actively cutting out the angles because they're they're going from watching this angle right here and there's a door, right? So they're watching here. And if you go out wider, now they have to peek back even further, which means the guy that's in front can keep moving up and up and up and up and up until all of a sudden they're looking at the guy that's way out to the far right. And you were right yep. in front of them waiting to come around that corner because they're not looking at you anymore. Yeah, so yeah totally. It's, it's a lot of just knowing, like, I know. If I need somebody to move or if I need to move and I look at my guy next to me and I say, Edgar, I need you to shoot this position or I need you to go now. It's just a, all right, we're doing yeah. it. I'm going to put fire down. We're going to do it. Because at the end of the day, yeah, getting hit sucks. It's airsoft. But like sometimes the best moments ever are like just absolute. I just need to trust that this is going to suck probably. And we just need to wing it and just go like, all mm -hmm. right, Jordan's going to put down fire. Uh, Jeremy's going to follow up on me. And then as soon as I get into a position, I'm going to stop firing and Jeremy's going to start shooting for me. You know, uh, half the time, it's just like, are you actively suppressing the enemy? If the box is checked, yes, that means you should be trying to move. If that mm -hmm. person is not able to do their job and suppress you anymore, that means that your team should be moving. And that is difficult, more difficult to do as a rifleman, but still absolutely possible. I've gotten suppressed by many accurate rifles just single semi-auto firing that has put me back into my position where I need to be like, all right, I need to do something else about this. Um, but the especially key if concept, they shoot as much as I do. Am I right guys? Uh -huh. Especially if they're going yeah. through 3000 BBs in a 15 minute period, like, yeah, like, yeah. like Phil is cause he carries out a speed loader and loads them on the field and everything mid. -combat. You know what? You know yeah. what? <laughs> but yeah, you can hear him shaking like a maraca. Uh, but anyways, uh, I got the silencers in my Odin. Don't even worry. Yeah, about okay. It. Okay. Sure. 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 But half the time it's like, all right, are you suppressing? Yes. Move. Mm -hmm. Are you actively making the enemy contemplate whether or not they're able to peek you? Yes. You should be moving. And this is how it works in a lot of different games. If you've ever watched paintball, in paintball, the whole game is like shooting lanes of suppressive fire. When yep. the game starts, and this happens in Speed QB as well, like the actual like Speed QB tournaments where it's set up like a paintball field. When the game starts, half the time you'll see people just off the drop, lifting up their, their markers, and they're just shooting a lane. They're just shooting that lane because they know that people are going to run through that lane and there's a chance that they could hit them. Yep. That, that suppressive fire to move is prevalent in almost every single combat game that there is. That yep. is the key. What is the key to aggression? Are you firing at the enemy? You should be moving up. Are you able to suppress them from doing what they're doing? You should be moving forward. You know, it's just yeah. gaining that position over and over. It's little pieces. If I'm if I'm asking somebody to move, I'm not expecting them to get 75 feet in the next 10 seconds. I'm asking them to get like 20 feet to my right to get another angle. And then we're just moving up, up, up and up until all of a sudden we are in an umbrella around the enemy and they don't have anything else that they can do. Yeah. Because we were able to move, move, move. So suppressive fire. And it's difficult fire. to do that. And it's difficult to do that if you're just sitting around, right? But I mean, it that's... Is. A, it it yeah. is super difficult. Yeah. So I got two more two more big questions <clears throat> for you. Um, one is about you and your team. And then the other is, you know, coming back to sort of the beginners and stuff. But so talking about you and your team, we've talked a lot about how, well, you know, it's airsoft, you get shot, you make mistakes, stuff doesn't work out, et cetera. How important is after action reviews for your team talking about what did work, what didn't work, et cetera. <clears throat> and what does that actually look like for you guys in terms of dialing in uh, your play style, your aggression, stuff like that? So we don't have, I mean, a few of us have cameras now. I know Edgar just joined the team recently. He has a GoPro, but we haven't done any like team review footage of what we do. 
Um, but very often, whenever something goes bad or it goes good, we find ourselves talking about what went good and what went bad and what we can do next time. Um, mm -hmm. I would say that after action reviews in general are the, one of the most key points of improving yourself and your group and what you can do next time. Because if you said, all right, we all died, let's go respawn, and then you go back out there without talking about it, there could have been something glaring that was a problem. And if nobody talked about it and nobody brought it up, it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. um, if, and for this instance, we were playing at Midsummer Nightmare. We got ambushed on the road. We saw it coming. Like we, we were walking and we saw these two guys were like, all right, are they just staff? Like, are they enemies? Like what's going on? Like we could obviously see each other from like 500 feet away. We saw them go into the woods and we're walking. I'm like, all right, we're probably going to get ambushed here. And what happened? We got ambushed <laughs> by, yeah. by the two guys that we were like, we're probably going to get ambushed by these guys. Matt literally told us the second before that, like, all right, if we start taking fire, we need to get up into the woods online because we were taking fire from a hillside that was covered in trees and we were out on the road. And anybody that's played outside before knows that if you are standing out in a bright area and there's woods, you cannot see into those woods. It's like looking at a window during the daytime from the outside. You mm -hmm. can like not see anything in there at all. It just looks like darkness. So the first thing that we were told to do is if we start taking fire, you run towards the fire and you get up onto the base of that, that hill so that you're able to provide covering. Of course, we didn't do that because airsoft. And uh, yep. as soon as we started getting hit, we didn't think about that. And to be fair, we had not really gotten ambushed that many times where we've had to employ that. We've gotten online many times while we were getting fired at, but mm -hmm. not from this specific position. And we were playing with a much bigger group of us as well, not just our core guys. Um, and after that, we're all looking at each other like, all right, what did we do? We didn't get online. <laughs> we, yeah. we didn't do the thing that we were supposed to do. I started yeah. getting shot and I took cover where I was and where I was was on the other side of the road, which meant I still couldn't see into the woods where those guys were. If I would have just started taking fire and sprinted up into the woods, now they got to deal with like eight guys that are online looking at where they could be as opposed to just seeing guys in the distance that they can actually fire, you know, get fired back at because nobody can actually see them and start putting mm -hmm. down fire. So after action reviews in general, even if it's just walking back and talking about it while you're dead, all right, what happened? You know, what, what do we think we could have done better? Should we have gone further? Like, oh, well, we didn't do that thing. We just said we were going to try to do. We got to try mm -hmm. that again next time to make sure it works. Uh, without that, you were doing the same thing over and over again. And I'm, I'm guilty yeah. of this as well. Um, I've gotten shot in the nose like four or five times in the past two months uh, at suddenly out of me wearing the same gear that I've been wearing for like a year and a half. It just started happening. Um, the definition of insanity is just doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same result, you know, expecting something different to happen. Yeah. If you are not, yeah. if you are not willing to be like, all right, that sucked. Why did it suck? What can we do next time so that it doesn't suck or maybe sucks a little bit less? What, what can yeah. we do next time to make it just a little bit better? Um, that, that is like the biggest growth point. So it is absolutely huge. We talk about it on the way back uh, from being dead. We talk about it as we're walking back out. Like, all right, this happened last time. We talk about it at dinner after, after events. We'll go back and we'll sit down at the table and be like, all right, guys, what did you like about that event? What do you think that we need to do better next time? Like, what do you think we need to change up? Um, you know, did, did squad lead like direction feel good? Do we need to try a different medic? Like all of these things come up. Um, and without that discussion, you were just being complacent. Uh, yeah. Does everybody take the game as seriously as, as everybody? No, absolutely not. I don't even think that our group is like a, oh, they're super crazy Milsim tryhard. Like they have ranks in their group. Like I, there's some groups that are like that and they're like ultra serious. We are just a group of best friends that know to play the game hard and we play to have fun, but we also have fun by playing hard and winning. So yeah. it's, it's a thing of like, all right, we are, we are just trying to do this. But at the same time, if we're not talking about it actively, we're just we're doing the same thing and that's no fun it's always yeah. fun to see yourself improve from the last time well it's, it's... this is yeah and this is why it's so funny like people will say and i think they're right it's like well i don't you know i don't really think about this kind of stuff i just want to have fun playing airsoft fair enough but you know what's fun winning you know what's yeah, not fun absolutely. losing all yeah. the time and so at some point for for people who are like well i just enjoy playing airsoft i don't care if i win or lose Cool, that's fine. But at some point, you're going to want to get better. And it's it's kind of hard to do that if you're not sort of critically evaluating sort of 
what went well or what have you. And again, I, you know, I'm writing a, a video that I'm going to shoot eventually talking about this kind of stuff. But I think, you know, the, what you're saying about the after action, like it doesn't have to be so serious. I also, as a side note, I think it's so funny. Like all these ops have like act, after action reviews and like, they're so far removed from what an after action review is supposed to be. Yeah. They it's don't actually not even do funny. It. They just but talk like, about the game. Yeah. It's yeah, not exactly. It's not how it's supposed to be. Yeah. One of the things though, I think that's, that's challenging is that, sometimes you lose or you something doesn't go well because someone made a mistake right someone did something stupid someone did something shitty someone was lazy someone was complacent it's their fault that the thing happened right and you guys are all you know your friends and stuff like that i think it's it's important when you're doing these after actions to be very specific about like what you know what didn't go so well so like just as a, as a random example you know, like uh, I've had games where I came up the field with, with John and I asked him, it's like, hey, uh, what, what do you think didn't go so well that game? And he's like, yeah, our comms could have been better. OK, what he means by that is, Phil, you did not do a good job at communicating. Right. That's what he yep. means. But he says, well, comms weren't very good. I know him. I can read between the lines. If I couldn't, though, I'd just be like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But we're not growing from that. Right. So. I'm just curious, just lightly, like, are, are those the kinds of conversations that you have with your guys in terms of specifics about when, when there is fault? Not that there is fault to lay and blame, but to at least say, like, this didn't go well because this guy, this happened. How are we going to make sure that doesn't happen again? Like, are you having those conversations too? Absolutely. Um, it is never in an aggressive or mean or, like, yeah. <laughs> making the guy feel bad. Um, but there's been plenty of times that I have screwed up and gotten us shot. Or mm -hmm. I have done something stupid and gotten a scene. Um, and I, I think a big thing about being able to grow from that is being able to take responsibility for that. Um, yes. It's not like, all right, man, that really sucked. Jordan, you, you suck. You did this wrong. And I'm like, no, it's not my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. Sometimes you do suck. Sometimes that's yeah. how it works. Sometimes yeah. you did make a huge mistake and your entire team died for it. That literally just happened. I screwed up at Scapegoat. And got my entire team killed, like or almost killed. We didn't accomplish our mission because I screwed up from the very beginning. And it was a, I'm sorry, guys. Like we should have tried it a different way. Like we we should have we should have did this. I should have asked you guys, you know, what we should have done after the first time it didn't work. It is not a game of I'm right and you're wrong. It's a game of we are all here to have fun. Let's improve and let's yeah. do better next time. So I'm not going to say that there isn't times that like we've gotten like a bit like miffed at each other. Like, dude, what the hell? Why would you do that? And then they're like, "Whoa, I didn't know it. Like they're definitely the conversations. Totally. Like that, yeah. That you're humans, like, right? That, like... Yeah. That's how it works. Sometimes nobody wants to be wrong. Mm -hmm. But when you establish that, like, yeah, what I just did or what they just did was a detriment to what we were trying to do, whether that is being too loud or not taking it low enough, not, not taking it slow enough for people to, to spot you out before you are getting into a position. You know, maybe you talk too loud or maybe your damn radio crackled while you were trying to hide. And now all of a sudden your entire position is, is exploited because people know where you are. Yeah. That stuff happens on the field. That is how you learn what not to do next time or how to avoid it in the future. Um, I screw up all the time. And I'm a firm believer in the only way that you'll get better is by screwing up so many times. Because if you keep just doing things and they just keep working all the time, man, what are you going to do as soon as one of those things doesn't work? Yeah, really. What are you, you going to do? If you know that every time you play this field, oh, I go to the far right, I know it's going to work every single time. What happens when that does not work? Maybe it's a higher chance of it working sometimes, but if you are not fully expecting for something to go wrong, at any given point, you're you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. You're going to get caught on the back foot, not ready to, uh, you know, further yourself in that situation. Yeah, you need to go into every situation with the plan of like, all right, this is how I want it to work. But if something doesn't happen, what can we change next time so that we can fix this? So we've had many yeah. times where it's like, oh, communication that was bad. We need to talk more. Man, I needed you to cover me going out further wide. All right, I'll try to do that next time. Sometimes it's like Jordan, you got me killed. Man, that sucks. Let me try to yeah. not have that happen next time. Um, it's uh, it's it's funny because when I was talking to Matt about this, like this came up too. It's like 
you can have, you know, there's a saying, you know, no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy or whatever. But like the version that I prefer is to think about like, you know, you have a plan, like you were just saying about how you want this to go or whatever. Unfortunately for you, the enemy gets a say. Yes. Right. And so if to your point, like if you're not prepared for things to go sideways, you're putting yourself at the disadvantage because they're certainly thinking about how they can exploit whatever it is that you're going to do. Right. So yes. I think that's. Yeah. So of something that I just want to say, so Gordon, the guy that runs Stack Ops, um, he is, and I've heard him say this many times, so I wouldn't say that this is his thing to say, but almost every time I talk to him, it's something like this. When we're asking about like, all right, what should we do here? What should we do here? His answer is, I don't tell you how to do this. I'm giving you the situation and you need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. How are you going to move forward from this? I'm I'm presenting you with a challenge and you yourself now need to figure out how you are going to, to overcome this challenge. Because like you said, sometimes things go perfect and everything works. That is amazing when that happens. Yeah. But and very rare. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes, and most of the time, something like that doesn't happen. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're trying to get not spotted, you get spotted. Now what do you do? You can't just freeze up and be like, all right, well, now we, we're done because they, they spotted us. That is part of growing as a group. That's part of growing as a player. That's part of being able to make those quick decisions because you've made them before. This has happened to you before now. You've been sneaking and then all of a sudden you got suppressed by an enemy LMG from 100 feet away, accurate fire, and you got nowhere to go. You've had that situation happen before and you've reacted and maybe it happened negatively maybe it happened positively but that is like a, a checkbox like all right I'll, let me take note of that this did not work last time write this down remember when this happens next time let's try something else let's yeah. try something different um maybe i don't hit the deck in the middle of the road as soon as i get fired at which i see so many people do you know they start yeah. getting fired out in the middle of the woods the first thing they do is they hit the ground you know sometimes maybe it works but as soon as it stops working you need to be like all right what do i need to do instead that's the only way you will progress and get better. And if that's if you want to get better, you need to be doing this. Maybe you are playing Airsoft just to have fun. And I wouldn't even say that we're all about winning because there's plenty of times where we lose and we have a great time because we sure. did well ourselves. But man, is it so much better when you are playing the game and you and your squad do well and you see a direct influence on the team around you because of something that you guys did to contribute to that success. It is a team game. Me and my team of eight people could not win a game of 50 on 50 just by being us eight. We might be able to put our team into a very good position by doing something, but that is still our team needing to be there to help us. And yeah. it is so much better when you can do that and it comes out positively. So it's not going to be our case at Iron Horse. It's going to be the 15 of us <laughs> winning the whole pan no. side. That's going to be no. it. We'd be like, Phil, I need you to move. And you're going to be like against the wall. Like, uh, I don't know where to go. And I'm gonna be like, Phil, <laughs> yeah. I need, I need you to shoot, man, do something. It's like, no, it's... Oh, I don't know how this works. <laughs> I don't remember how to shoot my gun. Yeah. No. <laughs> so no. the last question that I had for you, I guess, and we've talked about this, I think throughout the episode, but just to, to sort of just summarize it, what is the biggest mistake that you see amongst like the more novice Milsim players, right? And I'm not talking about those who are like the the veterans, uh, veteran players. So not not the military veterans, but the veteran main, players who've played Milsim many times, and they're just sort of stuck in their ways or whatever. But I'm talking about like the the newer players who are just you know dipping their toes into it, who are still trying to find their groove with the Milsim in the Milsim space. What's something that they can start doing, basically, or applying as a result of listening to this episode, maybe that would make a big difference for them in the next very next game that they play. I mean, first of all, I'm just going to say communication. Improving yeah. your communication is going to be a net positive always across the board, whether or not that's getting your radio situated, whether or not that's figuring out a, uh, you know, a code that you use. Maybe that is just talking about like, what are we going to say next time? Maybe it's, you know, surveying the field before you go out. So you're a little bit more aware of what you're walking into before you go out there. But what is something besides communication? Because communication, you don't need to be at a milsim to work on. You can practice it at, at any skirmish. And that translates very well into milsim games. Mm -hmm. um, I would say start doing the hard stuff. Start doing the hard stuff and being willing to do the hard stuff. Does that mean that every single time there's a puddle on the ground, I want you to go prone in it? Just because yes. that's going to make it harder? Yes, that's what he wants. <laughs> that, that, horrible, <laughs> horrible idea. We We had somebody that was 
that was running with us do that and then he left like an hour later after that he was just like yeah i'm just gonna go prone in this puddle and then he left i'm like okay bye see you later Stay hard. Please, <laughs> please please don't ever do that again um yeah but do the hard stuff sometimes it's not possible sometimes there's people that are playing the game that do have a medical condition or they do have a physical restriction that stops them from doing sure. stuff you know i had asthma and i have asthma and sometimes that has you know slowed me down from doing what i'm doing but the mindset of doing the hard stuff doing the things that people don't want to do not going straight forward to the point maybe taking the longer route maybe looking up at that hill to your right and being like wow this is going to suck but Imagine the position we're going to get into when we actually get up this hill. Mm -hmm. Imagine the better spot we're going to be when we do this. The mindset of just not taking the easy way out, maybe working a little extra hard to get to where you need to be, is, I think, in my opinion, the most, the, the best advice I can give to anybody that's coming into Milsim because you are going to be playing against a bunch of people that are going to be willing to do that. And if you are not willing to at least try, or at least play with the idea of, oh, maybe we should try to do this, maybe even attempt to do it, you are going to actively be putting yourself into bad situations all the time. At yeah. Milsims, almost every single time, if you walk straight to an objective, you are going to die. Yeah. That is just how it works. And that's not being aggressive, right? That's no. not, that's just that's, being stupid. That's being dumb. That is yeah. being dumb. You need to be willing. And I'm not saying you need to be willing to crawl for 300 feet. But you need to be willing to do the stuff that you really don't want to do because it's going to further you, because mm -hmm. it's going to put you into a better position. So get the mindset out of your head of like, I just need to be on the point first. I just need to be here first. I just need to run at them. I just need to be faster than them. Like I've heard people be like, oh, I uh, I don't get hit just because I, I am always running. They can't hit me while I'm running. But I guarantee you that you have been hit while you're running and you will continue to be hit while you're running. <laughs> yeah. That's not that's not always how that works. But yeah. Yeah, Phil, I mean, I've been I've just been rambling on this, like of doing the hard stuff. But really, and I, you know this, you you guys have done the hard stuff. You understand what it's like when hard stuff is done against you. The hard stuff done against you sucks. The hard stuff when you're doing it also sucks. But the reward that you get when that hard yes. stuff goes really well is amazing and is the yeah. best thing that you could be doing. That feeling of pride and accomplishment is second to... Well, maybe a couple of things, but it's pretty, it's, it's up there. <laughs> it's up there. It's up there. Yeah. Yeah. You look back at your friends and you're like, man, that sucked, but it was awesome. Yeah. And we did it dope. and we yeah, are going to exactly. do it again and we are going to do it again. Yeah. So, well, Jordan, thanks so much for being on with us to talk about sort of aggression in Milsims. And, you know, it's a, it's a different perspective. It's going to be interesting. The, the, we're actually, uh, we're doing a surprise part three, which is going to be with you and Matt talking about some of your like combined experiences. Uh, and it's going to be a fun conversation. So, I'm, you know, hopefully uh, if you've listened to parts one and two, you'll stick around for part three. But uh, that's all we've got for you. Th Jordan, once again, thanks for being here. It's always it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, that's all we've got for you this week, guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in and we'll talk to you next week. See you later.